China's economic woes lingered, tensions with Taiwan remained high, and investors looked with even more interest to India. That was 2023 in the Asia-Pacific region. Not all of the stories, of course, but the ones that we want to talk about today, especially as we look to next year. Well, joining me now is Alicia Garcia Herrero, international economist at Natixis and senior fellow at Bruegel, a think tank in Brussels. Alicia, welcome to the show. Let's get right to it and look at the Chinese economy. Alicia, we know that for this region, the Chinese economy is really at the center of it, and yet it's been struggling over the past year. It's really never come back from the, uh, this, its pandemic downturn. Uh, joblessness is a problem. We know that uh, the property sector has really been beleaguered. Are we going to see it improve next year, or are there more structural problems at hand? What do you see? Well, uh, next year growth will be lower than 2023 for the simple reason that, although you're right, I mean, we've, we have had a tough year, still the base effects compared to 2022, which was even worse, 3% growth, were there supporting the economy. So we will end the year with something like 5.2. Next year will be around 4.5, which is a deceleration. And as you rightly point out, this is a structural. This means that China has some headwinds which are not going to stop in 2024. For that matter, not even in 2025. These headwinds are obviously aging, but most importantly, a, an increasingly low return on assets. So for every RMB that you put into circulation in investment, you're going to get a lower and lower return. Why? Because there is overcapacity in China. Investment is excessive. China needs a new economic model and is struggling to find that new model. Mm. Yeah, critics have said that China really missed its chance to transform its economy to one that's more consumer focused. And now we see it obviously trying to ramp up a higher level of manufacturing. Um, do you see that effort, this, this sort of in a way that maybe if we could draw a parallel to Taiwan, this advancement of the kind of manufacturing it's doing, do you see in that effort um, anything that could be promising for its future? Or could that actually be maybe problematic for the rest of the world too? Absolutely. So uh, pushing uh, manufacturing investment, which is what China is doing, is obviously a way to keep investment going because investment into the real estate sector is plummeting. It's basically growing nearly double digit. So minus 9.7 was the last, latest number. So they need to do something about investment. And the most productive they can think of is manufacturing. Uh, basically um, upgrading uh, China's industrial power. Is that a good thing? Well, it depends on whether you can sell all of that and to whom. Mm. If you can sell it to your own population, I think it's great. But then you need to, to support consumption, not only uh, production. And that's something we're not seeing very clearly, as, as, as you rightly point out. Instead, the other way out for this uh, additional capacity is exports. But we see we just had an announcement today of Biden considering additional import tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles. So, you know, who is left? Europe is left. Europe is the largest trading partner for China today. And that is a worry. It should be a worry for Europe because all of that additional capacity may end up in, on our shores. And, and indeed, this is a problem for us. We know that, that Europe is already worried, of course, about uh, a lot of those electric vehicles uh, as its stalwarts in that industry uh, try and compete with Chinese manufacturers. Uh, Alicia, I want to ask you about Taiwan. Um, the island is going to the polls in just a few weeks, and it's quite likely that the party that Beijing doesn't want to win, the DPP, the party that stresses Taiwan's sovereignty, is the one that's going to win. Um, what are the stakes for this region when we look at this? Is this uh, potentially a shock for a short term or is this uh, pose a long term issue for this region? Well, I would argue that uh, the DPP winning the elections was kind of the baseline scenario. If you ask me, I, I'm actually quite surprised that the KMT is very close to the DPP in the polls, uh, increasingly so. We had a nice um, uh, suite, if I may say so, from China, I think yesterday or, or this morning, announcing that they would lift import tariffs on agricultural products from Taiwan. So you see, there's a lot of support 
right before the elections. But I still think that the DPP will probably still win at the end of the day. But it will not win in a way to control the let's call the, the the legislative power the UN as we as as Taiwanese say and that means that it will be a weak government and that's very worrisome because they may have problems in say stepping up military um, purchases uh, and, and any other law that might be needed to kind of rein in uh, Taiwan's status quo so you know the elections to me, Call for problems, but it's not only only about China and DPP winning. It's about the type of win we will get, which to me will be quite poor in terms of control of the legislative, as I mentioned. Mm. You know, investors have been wringing their hands over tensions between China and Taiwan over the past several years, uh, as well as several other concerns around China, whether it's human rights or its handling of the pandemic. And now many are putting more resources in other Asian economies. Let's look at this real quick. Earlier this year, investment bank Goldman Sachs noted that foreign investment inflows in China over the preceding 12 months totaled $32 billion dollars. Whereas $39 billion in Asian markets, excluding China, uh, is what, by comparison, seeing $39 billion going to other Asian markets, excluding China, I should say, most of that going to India and Vietnam. Now, that's the first time in six years that China has pulled in less than its neighbors looking at that FDI figure. Excluding the China, excluding China, by the way, has become something of a buzzword on financial markets over the past two years. At least 15 exchange-traded funds have taken uh, have taken off under monikers including the term ex-China. Among them, the iShares MSCI Emerging Market X China ETF, which has seen its volume grow tenfold to over five billion dollars as of late, and has grown over 15 percent in value this year alone. Let's go back to Alicia Garcia Herrero, senior fellow at Bruegel. Uh, Alicia, Apple is probably one of the highest profile companies to make a big turn toward India in particular, and really one uh, away from China, uh, with reports that its chief supplier Foxconn wants to build 50 million iPhones in India annually. That would be equivalent to a quarter of entire production as it stands right now, and that it wants to do that in the next few years. Um, Alicia, is this a trend that we're going to see continuing in the years to come, especially towards India, but also elsewhere in Asia? Absolutely, because the trend is China for China and the rest for the rest. And that's where we are. So basically, if you want an iPhone sold in China, you would produce in China. There's many, many reasons for this, including, which is actually quite fam painful for foreign uh, businesses in China, cross-border data regulation. So, you know, you don't want to be caught into not being able to provide data about your clients or about, you know, your production and 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 and, and get it uh, basically insulated in China. So you can do that if it's China for China, if you localize in China. And that's basically what companies are doing. So kind of a, an ecosystem for China and the rest out of China. And, and they avoid all kinds of things. You have a export controls, they can avoid import tariffs from the US, cross-border data control, you name it. So yes, this trend is going to continue. And also bear in mind that to sell an iPhone, iPhone in China is increasingly difficult because it's actually Huawei who is, is making uh, the day uh, with its new, um, uh, basically, um, access to apps, uh, uh, trespassing the, the 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 limits of of um, uh, basically Android. So if if you think about that, what's the future for for Apple in China? Well, there is a future, but it's much more constrained than it used to be. So China for China is smaller for foreign businesses, and and business out of China is becoming bigger because India is growing faster than China. You name it. So it just makes sense for companies to do this. At the same time, we know that companies, major multinationals, have struggled with India in the past, including with its lack of infrastructure, uh, lack of educated workers in some cases, and then competition rules that can make um, being there difficult. Have those issues improved, or is it just that companies want to stomach them now because of the way China is? Well, put it this way, companies know that it will take a long time for China to improve, uh, for India to improve its, its infrastructure. And that's exactly why they are betting on several options. So it's not really China plus one, one being India, it's China plus N. 
And this is a South Korean concept, which I find very, very, you know, very smart. And that end could be, say, India plus Thailand. In fact, uh, Apple has announced Thailand as the center of production of Macs and, you know, adding one more country for iPads, etc. So basically, this is costly, let's face it. This is a fragmentation of the supply chain. But I think companies are ready to take that cost because depending on a single source of, of inputs, i.e. China, has proven to be very risky. So maybe it's not only India, it's very, very many more places other than only India. Alicia, we want to wrap up with a look at another major economy in this region and one that has been something of an outlier among its peers, and that is Japan. Right now, it's the only major economy maintaining a negative interest rate. In other words, encouraging economic activity at a time when other economies are trying to put the brakes on it and rein in inflation. Uh, for our viewers, let's take a look at this. The other major central banks, the Fed in the U.S., the European Central Bank and the Bank of England, all having tightened monet monetary policy over the past two years in that effort to rein in inflation. All of them just now signaling that rate hikes might be coming to an end. Uh, the Bank of Japan, meanwhile, has kept interest rates in negative territory since 2016. You see it under there for those who are looking, uh, that orange line that just remains flat. And uh, it left it unchanged at negative uh, one-tenth of a percent at its last meeting. I believe that was just a few days ago. Let's go back to Alicia Garcia Herrero, our senior fellow at Brugel. Alicia, Japan has been waiting in a way for domestic demand to take over the heavy lifting being done by the Bank of Japan. Um, are we getting closer to this happening? Are we seeing this kind of domestic demand starting to, to domestic demand starting to pick up a bit more? Yes, I mean BOJ has been loud and clear in my view it's going to move out of negative territory. And the reason is perhaps not so much amazing demand. Actually, this was quite good, but we're back to around 1% growth next year, even with a fiscal stimulus. So the reason is not that Japan is suddenly going to become China, as some people you know, have actually pushed in the market because the stock market has done so well this year. Not really. It's because nobody wants to be stuck in negative rates. You know, the, the, the kind of negative consequences that we see, yeah, for the financial sector, are for, for people saving, for you name it, it's just too, it's, it's just mind boggling. So I think BOJ knows they need to exit and they will. What's their reasoning? It's actually wages. Uh, because inflation is quite high in Japan, it's already 3.3. .3, so, you know, it's this inflation to move out of these extremely lax monetary conditions. But the problem is that the BOJ, and I do agree with them, knows that this inflation is transitory, that wages across the economy are only growing around 0 0.8, and that's very low. So they are pushing companies to raise wages and in a way to make this virtuous circle, as the BOJ calls it, between the inflation we see and the disposable income. Otherwise, mm. Japanese households will suffer. So, they, so to, they want to see that and they need some time. That is wage negotiations in spring. So we should not expect the BOJ, they just had a meeting uh, yesterday, to hike mm. tomorrow. They're going to hike only after the wage negotiations uh, in, in spring, in uh, late spring. And we'll have to leave it there for now. With that, I want to thank our guest, Alicia Garcia Herrero, Senior Fellow at Bruegel and Chief Economist for Asia Pacific at the French Investment Bank, Natixis. And of course, we thank you, our viewers, for tuning in or for checking us out on YouTube, I should say. Do check out our other videos here on YouTube and online at dw.com business. Take care.